Coming up on Tech News Today, the patent wars powers gang up on Google, but Google's mystery barge secret is revealed and a mystery malware that travels by computer speaker. All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Friday, November 1st, 2013, All Saints Day. Tech News Today is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. For a free trial and 10% off, go to squarespace.com and use offer code TNT11. And by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your used gadgets. Find out what your used iPhone, iPad, and other Apple products are worth at gazelle.com. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Maya Zaktar. And I'm Emergency Jason and Alex Gumpel trying to figure out what buttons to hit on the new TriCaster. Hey, thanks for filling in, Alex. Uh, Jason had a last-minute daycare situation. Uh, so Alex very valiantly leaped into the breach. Uh, we're very happy to have him along as we bring you the top technology news of the day, starting with, as we always do, the news. Hey, the new iPad Air went on sale today in 42 countries. That makes it the widest Apple tablet launch yet. Prices in the U.S. start at $499 per usual. Uh, because no pre-orders were allowed, uh, several Apple stores had customers lining up to buy the new tablet. The new Retina iPad Mini goes on sale later this month, though no date for that one has yet been set. Got mine online. Going to go pick it up in store later today. Remember last year when the Rockstar Consortium, backed by Apple, Microsoft, BlackBerry, Sony, and Ericsson, closed its purchase on thousands of former Nortel patents for $4.5 billion? Well, at the time, the team agreed to license the tech on fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory terms. Those FRAND terms. According to Reuters, Rockstar, now, along with another company, Netstar, has filed a lawsuit against Google over seven of those patents, reportedly covering the ability to match internet search terms to advertising. Other companies targeted include Android device makers Samsung, LG, Asus, HTC, Pantec, ZTE, and Huawei. Oh, everybody's suing everybody. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. I feel like the boy who cried wolf, but this time, I, I'm telling you it's true, the Nexus 5 was listed on the Google Play store, and it was on purpose this time. You could actually buy a 16-gigabyte model for $349 or a 32-gigabyte model for $399. For specs, all of those leaks were pretty much right. Nexus 5 comes in black and white, uh, supports LTE, has a 1080p 4.95-inch screen, and is powered by a 2.26 gigahertz Qualcomm Snapdragon 800 processor. Now, originally, shipping times were three to five days, but as of this morning, the 16-gigabyte model is sold out for the time being, and the 32-gigabyte version ships in two to three weeks. Google also launched its KitKat version Android 4.4 Thursday with Senior Vice President of Android Chrome and Apps Sundar Pichai promising, quote, you have one version of the operating system which will run across all versions of Android smartphones. So bear with me. Let's see how that shakes out. Ships on the Nexus 5, as I has just mentioned, and KitKat will soon come to the Nexus 4, the Nexus 7, and the Nexus 10. Coming weeks, says Google. Samsung Galaxy Nexus, however, will not receive the KitKat update. And Gadget says its sources say this is because of the Texas Instruments chipset. TI no longer supports that because they laid off all those people. HTC told in Gadget the Google Play edition of the HTC One will get KitKat in 15 days, other unlocked versions in 30 days, and all HTC One's in 90 days, and Motorola published a list of its phones that will get KitKat, including Droid Ultra, Droid Max, Droid Mini, and Moto X, but they didn't give a time frame. The contents of those mysterious barges, the Google San Francisco barge at least, has reportedly been revealed. Local CBS station KPIX5 reports multiple sources that say the barge's space will be taken up by luxury showrooms for the company's upcoming Google Glass headset, with the top floor of the barge being reserved to be a party deck. The project is under the oversight of Google co-founder and Google X leader Sergey Brin, and the plan is to upstage Apple's retail stores with the dazzling and unusual showrooms. I have to point out, Google X leader, not X leader. <laughs> Very big difference right there. Mistake. Correct. Yes, no E. 
No E. Comcast donates a Seattle mayoral candidate. Sounds like a boring story, right? But you'd be wrong. <laughs> Current Seattle Mayor Mark McGinn is behind a public-slash-private initiative that would bring the city inexpensive internet with speeds of up to 1 gigabit per second for 80 bucks a month. Now, McGinn was asked on a Reddit Ask Me Anything what would happen to that fiber network should he lose to challenger Ed Murray. Now, McGinn said, quote, I don't know, but I do know Comcast gave Murray a big pile of money, end quote. And that statement strongly insinuates that maybe a Comcast-backed Seattle mayor would favor Comcast and not a low-cost alternative. A spokesperson from Candidate Murray says that the city would honor the pilot program but was noncommittal about the future of fiber in Seattle. Thanks, PC guy 8088 for submitting this to the subreddit. Wow. You mean money might affect politics? I'm shocked. Uh, many websites launch badly, speaking of politics, but few as badly as the U.S. government's healthcare.org health insurance exchange website. And rarely do websites get to call the entire tech community to help fix their problems. Google, Red Hat, Oracle, and other tech companies will contribute dozens of engineers and programmers in an effort to help fix healthcare.org's problems. U.S. citizens who don't have health insurance by March 31st may have to pay a fine of as much as 1% of their income. Google, Facebook, Twitter, and other tech companies are all pushing back against government requests for user data from things like publishing the numbers of those requests that they receive to having conversations with officials behind closed doors. Companies are building technical fortresses, which are intended to make that private information inaccessible to governments and spies. But there's an issue here, and that's that their business models rely on collecting that same data largely to sell personalized ads. So as long as these companies remain ad companies, mm -hmm. their data will remain a goldmine for law enforcement and spies. What's a billion-dollar tech giant to do? I guess just stop selling everything. Yeah, just, you know, you don't need ads. Right. What do you need them for? You're just getting <laughs> sued over their patents. Time Warner Cable lost 306,000 TV subscribers from July through September this summer when it, it attributes to its carriage dispute with CBS. During that dispute, Time Warner removed CBS... Showtime, and other CBS properties from its lineup and ended up issuing $15 million in credit to its Showtime subscribers who lost the service. By comparison, in 2012, in the same time period, Time Warner Cable lost 29,000 subscribers compared to 306,000. Thanks to NCD75 for submitting that in the subreddit. Someone claiming to be from the group Anonymous is taking credit for hacking the Singapore newspaper site Straits Times. Now, that paper is the country's leading newspaper. The person behind the attack goes by the handle The Messiah and said the newspaper misled the public in its reporting of an anonymous threat, the group Anonymous, to Singapore's infrastructure. Anonymous is against Singapore's new licensing regulations for news sites. The post by The Messiah says Anonymous will attack the infrastructure of Singapore only if the Internet framework gets implemented, not otherwise. By the way, uh, in insta correction, I said healthcare.org in the news fuse. It's healthcare.gov, obviously. I uh, did not mean to malign healthcare.org, whoever they may be. <laughs> Let's take a break and thank our sponsor for today's show, Squarespace, the all in one platform that makes it easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. You want reliability built in. You want a beautifully designed template built in. You want a commerce solution built in. You get it all with Squarespace. It's beautiful. They have more than 20 new beautiful templates on top of their already award-winning designs. It's easy to use. Uh, you drag stuff in, you drag stuff out. It makes it super easy for me to continually update swordandlaser.com or tommeritbooks.com. Uh, and it's inexpensive. It starts at just $8 a month and includes a free domain name if you sign up for a year at a time. Search engine optimized, hosting included. Go start a trial. Go just create any any website you've been thinking of doing. Sometimes I've even had stories of people who wanted the business's website that they love to be better. So they started them a Squarespace site and then handed them the keys, said, here, use this. It's going to make your website look a lot better. And you don't even give them a credit card or anything to start building your website. When you decide to sign up for Squarespace, make sure to use the offer code TNT11 to get 10% off and to show your support for Tech News Today. We thank Squarespace for their support of Tech News Today. Squarespace, everything you need to create an exceptional website. All right, it's Friday. No Len Peralta today. Uh, I assume it's because he's a saint uh, and it's All Saints Day, uh, but none of us are. And thankfully, Darren Kitchen, uh, who is a saint, was willing to join us anyway. Thank you, Darren. It's good to know that I am a saint now. So there you go. Back to my New Orleans. <laughs> the first patron, round. patron saint of hacking. Uh, <laughs> Hack5.org. Uh, we got a good mystery malware story to get to later in the show. Spooky. Uh, I know. It's a, it's, it's a good after Halloween story. 
Let's start off talking about that Nexus 5, though. We heard about it. Uh, for those who, who missed it, $349 for the 16 gig, $399 for the 32 gig. That's unsubsidized. That's that's your unlocked, I bought it at the Google Play Store. I paid full price for it. I can take it to whatever carrier will, it will work with. And, of course, it ships with KitKat, Android 4.4. And, as we mentioned, they're sold out, too, uh, at least for the time being. Uh, quick run through these specs. 1920 by 1080 just display 445 uh, ppi uh 2.26 gigahertz snapdragon 800 2 gigs of ram 80211 ac 2300 milliamp hour battery same as the nexus 4 with an 8 megapixel camera but they have a gyroscope built in so they get optical image stabilization it's cheaper than an iphone 5c unlocked anyway unsubsidized and it's about the same price as a samsung ace yeah yeah you probably haven't heard of it or the blackberry q5 that's the bargain blackberry so compare those specs, think about it that way. And don't forget that what Sundar Pichai said, KitKat itself uses fewer resources and can run on lower spec phones. Uh, they're thinking KitKat will be the thing that replaces everything, even though it's not going to run on the Galaxy Nexus. Google wants to dominate entry-level and mid-range phones. They're fighting off iOS on the 5C front. They're more often fighting off Windows Phone and upstarts like Firefox OS or the Ubuntu Mobile. Uh, Darren, how do you think they're doing with this rollout? Well, I mean, this is, they've been killing it every time with the Nexus because they're going about it the right way, saying, hey, this is the phone. It's the Google anointed phone. It's just got our operating system and none of that crap you don't want. And here's the price. It's, you know, uh, and I feel like that's always been the way to go. Just buy your phone unlocked, pay the full price because it's going to be cheaper in the long run than a contract. Uh, I'm excited about KitKat. I'm not sure if, you know, while you say, yeah, sure, it may be, you know, better geared towards lower end processors and whatnot, which is funny to think that a low end processor this year is like last year's high end. But still, um, I feel like once you load it up with apps, even, you know, a low powered phone running KitKat is going to become dog slow. I don't feel like this really competes with the low end stuff that, uh, you know, especially in other markets that Firefox has started to excel at. I'm more excited about the, uh, I guess, how, how KitKat's going to work with the Nexus 5 itself, because I'm assuming this, this, this piece of hardware is going to be optimized for this new operating system or the new version of the operating system. It's supposed to be a lot cleaner, a lot more Google Now centric. And that to me is, as Google Now gets smarter and smarter, this, one of the simplest new features that I, I found exciting when I was reading all the reports about uh, the upcoming OS is that when you look for a phone number, it won't just search your address book, it'll search online. So in case you didn't put a contact in, it'll do it for you. It's about what Google knows, not what your phone does. And I'm like, that makes a lot of sense because why do I have to go to the Google app, search for a phone number, then hit call if I can just have all that integrated together? I think that the that Android's gotten so mature that these little uh, niceties are going to make other operating systems look a little bit, well, dumb. And it's got the HDR Plus mode. It's got that home screen launcher where you just swipe from the left. You can still swipe from below if you want for the Google Now. You I can mean, say, the HDR okay, Plus Google. mode is, that's just a feature of Snapseed, right? Which is something that Google bought a while ago. Yeah, that's probably where they where they rolled it in from. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, I was actually playing around with this. Um, I mean, I, I know that this would be part of the Google Plus's version of Snapseed where you can, when you can um, edit stuff inside of Google Plus and that isn't available on iOS devices yet. I was playing around with it a little bit yesterday, though, because on the standalone app for Snapseed, it has been updated. And, I mean, it's not that cool. It's the sort of thing where it's like you really want to use it sparingly or everyone's going to have these ridiculously blown out HDR photos all the time. I mean, it's, it's, I guess it's a cool thing to say, yeah, we're the first phone, but I don't know how, how interesting that is. It, just a really cool camera is better. Yeah, and it's, you know, and, and that's the thing about the Nexus 5. It's a good camera. It's a good processor. It's a yeah. decent battery. And, th and that's what it's meant to be. At $349, though, when you start to compare it to the Samsung Ace and the BlackBerry Q5, suddenly it's a great bargain. So it's just a matter of whether you're a power user or not uh, is, is whether you're going to like that phone. We'll see about KitKat. It doesn't sound like they've gotten rid of all of the problems on rollout. 90 days from now, we'll know if they've been more successful at putting this on more phones than they have in the past with, with other Android operating systems. And they do get better every time. So I, I expect they will be better, if, if not maybe as quite as pervasive as Sundar Pichai would like to imply they will be. We started the week talking about a secret Google barge suspected to be by Google in the San Francisco Bay. CBS had reported it was a Google Glass store. 
and CNET had reported it was a floating data center. Well, CBS has got the last word. They've been following the story all week, I guess. Yeah, Sarah mentioned the news for you. So the, their, their latest report says the barge will feature, quote, luxury showrooms and party deck to market Google luxury. Glass and other gadgets to invita invitation-only clients, by the way. So it's not just open to the public. None of us, you know, uh, huddled masses. The building is made up of interchangeable 40-foot shipping containers, and the idea is that they could pretty much build this thing anywhere they want to at any given time. Uh, the lower three features of uh, lower three levels, they have showrooms that feature Chrome features and floor lighting. That's the uh, that's Chrome. What the, yeah, it, that was when I saw it in the report when it said Chrome features. I wondered if that was something that was mistaken by the report or if it actually will have Google Chrome in it. And we'll see. Uh, the top level, like like Sarah mentioned, is a party deck to feature bars and areas for VIPs to kind of chill and hang out. Uh, the report also says the Barge project was created at Google X, personally directed by Sergey Brin, who's you know got nothing to do other than build boat barge things. Uh, and it's not open right now because the project was delayed because of the U.S. Coast Guard. They labeled the building a floating vessel, and that means that it needs to meet a bunch of federally approved safety regulations, and it hasn't done that yet. So that's why it's still covered up. Darren, assuming all these details are true, that we're going to have this giant Google barge with a party deck, yes. what, do you, what do you think of this? Well, I think that, you know, Google thinks big thoughts, you know, they, they tackle these huge problems. And I feel like a massive problem that humanity has known is that 70% of the land mass on Earth is water. And that's, that's land mass that could otherwise be used for party decks and bars. <laughs> so I'm just saying, sign me up for the Google booze cruise. I'm ready to go. It's weird, that, though, because the, it's being positioned as sort of like, well, this is Google that's going to out Apple Apple with something a lot more special than, you know, Apple retail stores. But it's completely different. I mean, this is an invitation-only client. You know, this reminds me of like, okay, these are like cool, influential thought leaders that will be, you know, buttoned up, drinking expensive drinks on this barge. And then, yeah, up top is for like extra VIPs who probably... I don't know, work in venture capital or something. I mean, maybe I'm just being negative about this, but it doesn't sound like this is something that, you know, people of just uh, casually interested members of the public are going to have a whole lot of access to and then, you know, will result in more people buying a pair of Google Glass head, headwear, headset, head things. <laughs> Headgear. <laughs> I, I, I can't get the idea of those... Uh, mid 2000s videos of venture capitalists on yachts uh, in their swimsuits, you know, dancing and partying uh, while the recession was crashing all around us. So that's just what this, this strikes me as very not googly the way it's being built. Now, granted, all KPIX has done is said Monday. <laughs> It's probably for marketing Google Glass. And today they're like, ooh, it's three floors with a VIP suite up on top. We really don't know anything. This is their sources. Yeah, so far that Google hasn't made any mention as to what this is. And, and, and the, uh, in the, the video report that, that KPEX did, one of, the, one of the comments was, the amount of no comments we've received is piling up, which obviously doesn't tell us anything, but it was a nice little statement. I, I, if, if Google's going to do this, it does seem a little crazy. I wonder, though, if you're going to have this idea of VIPs only, is that actually going to create a, a cool factor around Google Glass? Because we sometimes mock it because it is a bit dorky looking right now. It's not like, hey, this is stylish and this is amazing. But if you only have invitation only celebrities or whatever, and they're coming in with their Google Glass, does it make it seem like a more cool and wearable device? Or does it just seem I like... Ayaz, you are so on it. Remember when Gmail first came out and you needed to get yourself a beta code invite to get yeah, in on that yeah. stuff? Those are the days. Right now, the Google Glasses were only given to a select few who now have like, oh, an invite and I might be able to hook you up. You know, it's totally preying on that exclusivity thing. And uh, having a barge means that they could potentially, you know, take it on the road and uh, not on the road, actually, but, you know, <laughs> uh, tour with this thing. And, um, and, and this is really the venue for special. Spectacle Fest. I heard that it's going to happen ah. next year because it's, it is. That's what this Literally. is. It's spectacle. Spectacle Fest. Uh, go look it up, folks, if you don't get that. I joke. don't know. I mean, maybe products are, we're all destined to have, you know, party barges for a variety of companies. And it'll kind of be like, let's all go down by the waterfront and Ooh. see who's having the best party. I don't know. Maybe, maybe this is going to be a huge hit. To me, it seems, it seems a little like, I don't know. 
Yeah, the first day that somebody gets Big trapped wiggy. in one of those interchangeable shipping containers and they got left there, that's going to be a news story. Huge yeah. news story. It's like, oh, I was trapped in one of the shipping containers and I was sent to Toledo. I, I say next year we do a pineapple train bus airplane. Zeppelins? Oh, Zeppelins are already Zeppelin. done. Ooh, right, that was uh, like that. Google. Darn mm. it. Right. I, th if this was a Zeppelin, I'd be more into it. This just seems like they're oh. saying, Google Glass, it's for snobs. TNT hovercraft. Okay, anyway. Yeah, yeah. My hovercraft is full of eels. Let's talk gambling. Something more wholesome, Sarah Lane. Yes. Looks like awesome. Delaware is allowing it online. That's correct. Delaware wants to take your money in more ways than ever. Uh, Delaware became the first state uh, yesterday in the U.S. to launch a what it calls full suite of internet gambling, hoping to... Revive the gambling industry, which at this point seems like it's 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 sort of losing out to the younger generation. So 25 to 75 players, so a very small portion of anybody in Delaware, who have already registered online at sites that are maintained by Delaware's three racetrack casinos, will be allowed to play during a week of testing the system. Now, assuming that everything goes well with them by November 8th, so about a week from today, anybody that's already registered and physically in Delaware will be able to play games like blackjack, poker, roulette, slots for money. Currently, mm -hmm. Delaware has been able to do some testing for people saying, well, you can't actually play any of this for money right now, but we're just going to let you play for fun. So at least we kind of get the sense of what the transactions will play out like. And the effort is to attract younger people, adults between ages about 28 and 35, who Delaware has noticed are really not going to the casinos. The average gambler who's going to casinos uh, that, you know, IRL casinos in Delaware are in their late 50s. So Thomas Cook, Delaware's finance secretary, says the goal is to generate new customers, not to see people who are going to the casinos start gambling from their homes. He says if that happens, quote, then we have taken a step back because it's taking away business from the bricks and mortar where people are employed. Now, Delaware is not the only state to be offering things like this. New Jersey is going to do something similar to this Delaware initiative later in November. But I have to think, you know, my first, my first reaction is, well, if you give people a way to gamble from home, from their pajamas online without having to go down to some physical casino, especially when you kind of get into that gray area of if somebody has a problem and maybe they're trying to hide it, then it seems to me like, well, they're absolutely going to take away business from a brick and mortar uh, casino, like a bookstore or a record store or a lot of uh, the other kinds of brick and mortar businesses that have suffered from the same thing being, being offered online. Darren, do you think that, uh, you know, it's just a little, I'm thinking a little doom and gloom for these brick and mortar businesses, or is this just going to attract more folks? No, you're not thinking doom and gloom. I mean, over a long enough time scale, do you really think those will exist in, in 100 years, and 500 years? I mean, when you talk about, um, you know, the younger generation in, in casinos, in fact, I don't ever anecdotally remember, uh, like every time I go to a casino, it always seems like the crowd is the older generation. So um, maybe it's just not geared towards us. But when I see ads right now about casinos, it's really like billboards stacking themselves up against apps, which is really interesting. Um, I feel like as far as this program is concerned, though, the biggest fail that jumps out at me is the whole idea of the physical location, because anytime that you take geolocation and the internet, you're just asking for fail. Uh, what, what's the name of that company that uh, beams TV shows from individual antennas? Uh, I'm just Aerial. wondering what Aerial. I'm going to need to... Yeah. I mean, who, who here doesn't have an address in Delaware? <laughs> you know? I do. Yeah, I, I I don't. But I, I don't I just see that's incorporated. Understand that they're important. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but I'm not physically there. I you know this. Let's let's be honest, folks. This is about Delaware getting tax money. Is what this is about. I mean, there was all of this outrage about gambling online, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And now that gambling online has been continuing outside of the United States borders for years, suddenly the states hit by budgetary concerns are looking at this saying, "Huh." And Delaware, being the state. Fam most famous for having friendly corporation laws is saying, 
you know what, we might, we might be able to make some money off this. Let's, let's give this a shot. And then this is a bunch of malarkey, in my opinion, like, oh, we don't want it to take away from that beautiful experience of smoke and ugliness that is the casino. Well, obviously, people will want to still do that. That's We're going to get some angry emails about the, the, these non-smoking sections about casinos, Tom. You know that now. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but, that's true. Yeah, the idea that it's geared towards younger people also makes a, makes a lot of sense. The idea if you're not going to go after the older crowd, a lot of older crowd don't really seem to care about the internet and want to go to a place and, and uh, throw away money. That's, that's a whole other thing. That's my, my view on gambling, obviously. Uh, but if they're going to get people in, might as well, might as well get tax money. If you're, if you're, like you're mentioning, Tom, you're going to have all these corporate-friendly and business-friendly laws. You might as well be making money on it, and that's one of the reasons why they have all these friendly laws. Uh, the question is, will it catch on with a lot more states? you got New Jersey, but if this becomes... Uh, no longer geofence, which is silly. Like, like, like Darren's mentioning, like, oh, wow, it's in Delaware. Do you need a billing address in Delaware? How are they going to check this? Because that's how Aereo checks VPN it. VPN and a billing address, done. There you go. I've got a better way for you to make some money. It's our second sponsor for today's show, Gazelle. You got, you got, you probably, you want to get the new iPad, right? Or something, or one of these tablets or phones with these new Nexus 5s. There's something out there you got your eye on. You want to get together a little money, sell your old gadget. You got an old tablet, you got an old phone. Go to Gazelle, tell them what it is. You're like, well, wait a minute, Tom. I'm not sure I'm ready to sell it yet. You got 30 days. You lock it in. You go to gazelle.com, G-A-Z-E-L-L-E.com. You, you tell them the condition. They'll even buy broken iPhones and iPads. You get a risk-free offer for your gadgets and free shipping. And then you'll get paid by check, PayPal, or an extra 5% with an Amazon gift card. I do it. I do it a lot. This is one, I'd be swimming in gadgets. I'm swimming in gadgets as it is. But one of the ways that I make sure that I, I can keep up is to sell my stuff on Gazelle because it's hassle-free and you get paid in cash. What's your iPhone worth? Take a minute. Go to gazelle.com to find out. Do it now, though, because your iPhone probably is not going to get more valuable the longer you wait. Gazelle.com. We thank them for their support of Tech News Today. All right. Rockstar Consortium, not Rockstar Games. Maybe there's a separate lawsuit there, but Rockstar Consortium is made up of Apple, Microsoft, BlackBerry, Ericsson, and Sony. They bought the 6,000 patents from Nortel for $4.5 billion in 2011. They outbid Google, as, as uh, Sarah mentioned. That was the famous, when Google was, was bidding Bruns Constant and Pi and the distance between the Earth and the Sun uh, and really confusing the other bidders. Uh, they ended up teaming up with Intel, and they got outbid by the Rockstore Consortium. Well, now, after the Department of Justice approved the FRAND, you know, fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory terms of these patents, they filed eight lawsuits yesterday in Texas federal court for violation of the patents. The defendants are Google, Google alone for, a, for an AdSense-related patent, as well as Samsung, LG, HTC, Huawei, Asus Tech, Pantech, and ZTE. Now, we mentioned all those before. Here's the, here's the lawsuit against Google. Google has infringed and continues to infringe several patents, use the same language. The 969 is the one I'm quoting here. By its manufacture, use, sale, importation, and or offer for sale of systems, methods, products, and processes for matching search terms with relevant advertising and or information based on those search terms and other user data. Now, the rest go after the, the actual devices themselves. Begun again. These patent wars have, Darren, and with a vengeance, this is like Ragnarok, Apple, Microsoft, Google, all in the patent-friendly Texas court. What do you think is going to happen? I mean, one thing is for certain that's going to come out of this, and that is we are going to need a new bumper graphic. Obviously. Yes. Um, Obviously. But no, I mean, the way that I, I take it, these patents, you know, the way that all of these tech companies silo their patents is for the same reason why, you know, us and the, the Russians siloed uh, nuclear missiles is for the mutually assured destruction. So if they start firing on each other, in the end, there's only going to be a lot of collateral damage in that we're going to pay a lot more money for stuff because they're going to be paying a lot more money for licensing. So hopefully the mutually assured part comes in place where that everybody has enough of an arsenal that they just call it a day. Well, yeah, after, after Google lost out in the bidding for this, they got to 4.4 billion and then they, then they gave up to Rockstar. Uh, they went and bought Motorola. Now, a lot of people at the time, myself included, felt that was a patent play. Would, do we have another shoe that's going to drop here? I don't know. It doesn't seem like it. Google hasn't done anything with the Motorola patents, and they seem to be serious about juicing up Motorola hardware to be experimental. I asked, what do you think? Yeah, I was, I'm looking at this, and uh, the idea of 
there, the actual lawsuit taking place already would would mean that there was a lot of discussions already. Because that's supposed to be the last resort, and I know nobody seems to believe that anymore, but a lawsuit suit's supposed to be the last resort when you when your negotiations fail. So there might be some kind of patent infringement happening somewhere. There's enough enough technologies out there that there's probably infringement on both parties' side. And as, as to the idea of destruction, I don't know if anybody's going to be destroyed. I always say this ends up with cross-licensing agreements. But the thing is, how on earth is this going to is this going to suss out when you have basically every major player on either side like of a lawsuit this this has to this might be the final one because everybody every major company is involved in this at this point somebody's got to gain control and it might just be a judge going look this has got to this has got to stop unless the legislation takes this over Although increasingly, I mean, if you look at this as a play against the Android operating system as a whole, I mean, yeah, I mean, Google's been targeted mostly, but I mean, pretty much all the manufacturers, big ones of Android devices are, are in here too. And there's more of them. I know Apple's powerful, like Microsoft certainly as well. Uh, you put BlackBerry, Ericsson, and Sony together, okay. But it seems like, I mean, what what's going to happen here is... is you know, Android has to lose some features. I mean, this seems like something that if it really started to get to that point would be a long drawn out years of litigation scenario. And I assume when Google decided to stop bidding on this, they figured, well, it'll be cheaper to spend 4.4 billion fighting this in court than to buy the patents at this point. We've driven the price up higher than, than our return. So now they have to now they have to execute on that that gamble, and it'll be very interesting to to see how this plays off. For consumers, though, these things never end up really changing everything. Anything it, it may pass along a, a little price increase, and it may occasionally cause a delay or an older model of something to disappear off the shelves. But they always work around them, so I'm still not expecting disaster here. What is up with this Chinese photo app that's very cute, by the way, and turns your, your photo into a cartoony picture of you? Do you really think it's cute? Have you tried it, Tom? No, the pictures I saw on this next web story look cute. Well, yeah, okay. Yeah, this is, you know, the, the reason you could be forgiven for not trying it out is it can be a little hard to navigate because the I whole thing is written Chinese. in Chinese. It's not localized. But Chinese app, uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to pronounce it, Momeng Jiang Ji, which translates as magic camera app, if you go into English, is number one in many, many app stores, not just in the Chinese app store, but, but, but many Western markets as well. The way that it works is you take a selfie, a photo of yourself. Once you're done, it spreads a little what it calls magic dust on your face, and then you're directed to a page where you put your face on some random cartoon character. Okay, fine. They got a lot of attention yesterday because there were some like spooky Halloween characters that you could use. But really, this is the sort of app where I look at lots of photo apps and I think, hey, there are a lot of apps that do things like this. It is currently ranked sixth in the overall free apps chart in the US and is in the top for photo and video apps, second overall in Australia, rising quickly in the UK, Canada, and Germany. This is all data from AppsFire. App Annie, which measure, measures uh, the growth of apps in the US, shows really crazy growth in the US over this week. There's like a, you know, a chart that just goes like this. And it's a little weird because as I mentioned, you could probably just hit some buttons and figure it out eventually, but the instructions themselves are not in English or, you know, in the case of Germany, German. So it's not as if this is like the easiest app to navigate. So Oriel Oehan, who's the co-founder of AppsFire, says something's up here. Quote, either there's something I'm missing or they're using fishy marketing techniques to grow and get positive reviews. The reviews in the US App Store all look strange. I can understand why it's successful in China or Asia, but it's ranking in the US doesn't make sense. Now, we are just looking at the App Store. The app isn't officially ranked in the Google Play Store as of yet. So I don't know. I mean, when you see something like this, is this App Store shenanigans? Or do we just not understand what the kids like anymore? Darren, what do you think is going on here? Well, both of those things are true. We don't understand the kids anymore. But I absolutely agree. This seems completely fishy, uh, at least in the U.S., because the app's not in English. <laughs> so um, it, to carve out a niche market of the otaku crowd, sure. But uh, to get those kinds of numbers, I, I'm not buying it. So I'd be interested in seeing the breakdown in a week or so when somebody's actually gone through and figured out, oh, why did that happen? Yeah, I'm trying to play with the app right now and see if I, with my 
uh, absolute zero knowledge of, of, of whatever language this is. This is Chinese, you guys say? I, I, yes. I can't identify it anyway. So I'm trying to mess with it. And it's not exactly super clear how to use it. There are limited options and things. I, I don't know why it would be ranking so high highly unless unless there's something I, I don't get. Oh, then again, I don't get the kids either, as Darren mentioned. The idea that you saw it once, uh, somebody else had a silly photo. Where did you get that? They have a link. It can go viral. But I, I, the fact that there's nothing written in English or other languages... And even when you go to Google Play, I'm on Chrome, it doesn't even try to translate it for me to explain what am I looking at here. Uh, but there are some reviews that say, you need an English version, can't save an Android. So I guess people are using it, but um, I, I don't know I kind of think this is probably like emojis back in 2007, 2008, whenever I first put them on the iPhone. It was a Japanese app that you had to figure out how to get onto your iPhone because it wasn't in the normal app store. And then it would add emojis to your to your keyboard. Now now you can do it that that just comes there. But but back then it was this weird Japanese app, and I didn't speak Japanese, but I got it. Brian Tong, a CNET, showed me how to do it, uh, and and lots of people were doing it for that reason. So I have, I have a feeling it's it's something like that. It's not nearly as mysterious though as bad BIOS. This this blew my mind when I read Dan Gooden's story about this on Ars Technica today. I was. Yeah, I read it too this morning. And it felt like a mystery, uh, a little mystery novel right here. So here's the, here's the story. It's about bad BIOS. It's a piece of malware that jumps air gaps. That's what the headline says, and that sounds crazy. So the story explains a, 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 a tale of a guy named Secure. I can't even say this guy's name right now. Dragos. Ruyu, he noticed that some of his computers were transmitting data specific to the IPv6 networking protocol, even though those machines had IPv6 completely disabled. So to get to the bottom of this, the researcher started removing components of the machines. So he took out the he took out Wi-Fi, disconnected Ethernet, took out Bluetooth cards, and even removed the power cable, wondering if there was any transmissions going on through the electrical. And the machine was still transmitting small amounts of data on the network. And within hours or weeks of wiping an infected computer clean, the odd behavior would come back. So this started becoming very strange. So there was some kind of self-healing capabilities, a case of a machine where the BIOS was reflashed, a new disk drive with zero data on it. And what happened? The registry editor was disabled. So this thing kept coming back. And so what, what Ruyu's theory is that is infected machines can contaminate USB devices and vice versa because he noticed the first time he attached a USB device to one of these things, the behavior started happening. As for the network transmissions, the malware appears to be taking advantage of high frequencies played from the computer's speakers and receiving data using the microphone for other machines. That's how they're talking to each other. When Ruyu took out the speakers in the mic of infected machines, the transmission stopped. So it looks like it's a valid theory. And it looked like, when I saw the story, I'm like, this, this looks fake. It looks like maybe it's a Halloween hoax. Ruyu's been a security researcher for years. He's been uh, talking about this on Twitter for a while. So this does not seem like a hoax. Darren, what do, you, what do you make of bad BIOS? Well, it's absolutely spooky. This is one of those things where at first I'm like, uh, this is April Fool's, right? But uh, no, I mean, all of these things are feasible. And you're right, Dragos is actually a very well-respected researcher. Uh, he's been doing this for well over a decade. And... Um, and the thing about it within the you know security community is that you would expect uh, with a report of something so fantastic like this that's on the level of Stuxnet or even above, uh, you would expect you know uh, releases of you know uh, sound samples, uh, uh, dumps from the USB, uh, copy of the BIOS. Uh, now, Dragos does say that he will release uh, more information uh, after CANSAC West. So maybe this is just pumping up and, you know, what sounds to be like an awesome talk at CANSAC West. So I have to make it out there for that. Uh, all of these things individually are, are possible. USB drives are, you know, have been notorious for uh, buffer overflow bugs in there. So that, that's absolutely true. IP6 is a favorite amongst hackers because not a lot of people are aware that it's built in and... Um, and not a lot of networking devices will have traffic rules for it, and so they'll just let things through. So that's absolutely the case. The ultrasonic frequency stuff is the things that throw me for a loop. Um, as someone who has actually recently been playing with air gaps, the, the concept of an air gap is, you know, this machine right here is connected to the internet. However, this machine right here is absolutely not. Um, and so I use this for, say, my secure PGP email, and I ferry information back and forth over USB. When I did a segment on Hack5 about that, people came up to me and said, oh, well, you know, you can, of course, infect a, a USB. So I'm like, all right, well, if I don't trust my USB, sure. And so I started playing with the idea of 
transmitting stuff between computers over sound, like going way old school uh, to, to modems. And that's how modems have worked, right? It's just, um, you know, uh, PSK or ASK or different modulation techniques. But uh, in, my, in my studies, you have to go down to like 110 baud. Uh, which, which I, I don't even know how many how how many fractions of a kilo, uh, of a megabyte per second that is, but it's it's insanely slow, uh, and even then it's really um, obvious. Uh, Subaudible, I don't know that that's that's the part that makes me really iffy on this, but it does seem glorious. Uh, so is it, is this a state sponsored advanced persistent threat? I don't know. I I hope to find out at Cansac West. Do you know what it reminded me of? Uh, was Bitcoin mm -hmm. the 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 idea that that someone out there not taking responsibility has created something incredibly technically sound? Now, obviously, Bitcoin is for a much better purpose, right? Uh, this this is for showing a security vulnerability. But then maybe they went after Ruyu because they knew he was smart enough to figure out how it worked. Like, why why uh, why else would you target that guy? You know what I mean? Mm. Or. Ruyu has a doppelganger that made this and planted it so he'd have an awesome talk. He was sleep to, hacking. To talk it was about. Ruyu himself. Yes. <laughs> He's talented. And it's it's Got demonstrating it. all of these proof of concepts that are capable. Right, right. He, yeah. did, it, he did it somnambulantly. Uh, no, it's really, it's really mystifying and, and really interesting uh, to keep an eye on. I'm hoping Steve Gibson tackles this next week on Security Now. I'd love to hear what he thinks about it as well. Let's fire up the randomizer, shall we? We had a straw poll today with our live audience, and 60% uh, voted for Dr. Mom's submission. 28 solar flares in the last seven days, and more may be coming. But don't worry, they don't seem to be messing with our electronics as solar flares sometimes in the past have. And a lot of researchers are happy. They're like, you know, the sun's been particularly quiet this summer and it's been really uninteresting for us. So if you're a Sunspot fan or, or a solar researcher, this is good news for you. Do you guys feel it? You feeling the Sunspot flares? I've been feeling really tired all week. So maybe it's the, the sun's sun, fault. must be the flares. Yeah. I've been I, I'm not kidding. Too much. Maybe that has something I've, to do with it. Mm. Yeah. Go, go sun. I think the sun is just kind of like trying to, you know, get some attention because everybody's been paying attention to Mercury in retrograde lately. So oh, that it's probably it? that. My energy's went through the roof. So maybe uh, this is good bad news when it stops. This is this is not good if it's over soon. Or are we getting Wait, more Wait, Mercury's soon? in retrograde? That's yes, what's going until on. until the 10th, until November 10th. Can you believe it? I'm not signing <sighs> any contracts until after. No way. Curtis B points out it's also good for the northern and southern lights. Potentially, the auroras might look cool with all these these flares. It's nifty. Go outside, take a look at the night sky if you live far enough outside. up or down. Yeah, get off the computer and go outside, you guys. Yeah, you read a flares. book. No, stay inside. Don't listen to these people. Go online. Hey, they got, wi hey, they got Wi-Fi outside. Oh, okay, go outside. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, let's see what's on the calendar, shall we? Let's do that. Hey, uh, we we've got a burial. Uh, R.I.P. I Google Google's personalized I, web no. portal has closed down. You know, there was a time where I had my whole iGoogle thing all customized, tricked out. I thought it was really great. Yeah, me but, too. But, you know, things evolve into barges offshore. <laughs> That's right. They need to Key save Frag that Frag Con is happening next week. It starts Monday the 4th, runs through Wednesday the 6th in Broomfield, Colorado. Darren, are you, uh, you're not going, are you? No, I use a solid state. Yeah, <laughs> I knew you were oh, going to say that. You beat me to it. stuff. But a ching. All right, uh, let's see what kind of emails we may have gotten, shall we? Sure. Incoming message. It's a message from Soundwave in chat. Uh, he says, greetings from Israel. He says, hey, Tom, Sarah, Ayaz, Jason, and Darren. I guess and Alex, too, because uh, emergency Jason over there. A quick thought about the pursuit story. I really like the idea, but as we know, battery life and data caps are two important issues on mobile for most people. And if we start seeding data all day long, it can cause a problem there. I'm not talking about personal uses, like uh, medical example, but more about broad usages, like the replacement for the App Store servers, for example. They could obviously do what Apple is doing with the iCloud backup, so it would it will seed only when you're charging the phone and on Wi-Fi, but that will decrease the amount of seeders dramatically. Have a great weekend. Yeah, that's a great point, actually. Thanks, Soundwave. Uh, I guess with computers and desktops could could shoulder a lot of the burden off the mobile devices that that wouldn't want to do this maybe when they were uh, when they were on battery power 
Uh, and this is a research technology, so maybe battery power gets better. But I do think that uh, the uploads have to be allowed. Remember, it's not the downloads that are going to be the issue in this situation. It would be all the uploading you're doing. And upload speeds are never symmetric from ISPs these days. So you'd have to have either symmetric or maybe mesh. Maybe this is a chance for mesh networking to finally take off, where you're just directly sending bits to other devices around you and instead of going through an ISP at all. It's, uh, it's good stuff, though. Thought-provoking. Sarah. Oh. Sorry like about that. Email? Angelo has the next email. Says, in episode 872, which was two episodes ago, while talking about the new iPad Air, you wondered why that iPad 2 is still on the market. He says, there's a simple reason for that. I know a lot of companies who use first and second gen iPads with custom built peripherals, which all use that 30 pin connector. These peripherals can be pretty expensive, more costly than an iPad, in fact. So companies choose to keep the peripherals around and replace broken iPads with the iPad 2 instead of replacing or even redeveloping the hardware. You know, Leo made the same point on iPad today yesterday, and I think that that's, that, that, that it makes a lot of sense. I mean, there are certain, you know, even sort of like these big arrays where you can charge 100 iPads at a time or 10 or something like that. You see them in schools. You know, a lot of, a lot of that stuff was a huge investment, and Apple may be uh, just realizing that enough of these companies and organizations just want more iPad 2s. Yeah, any, any enterprise rollout, including educational enterprise rollouts, that would make sense for. Thanks, Angel. Yeah, appreciate it. We that even use the iPad 1 here in the Hack 5 studio. You know, we've got 30 pin dongles for days and we're not going to replace them. Yeah, when, you, when you've invested, I mean, not that the dongles are that expensive, but if you have a lot of them, it's, it's expense and trouble that you don't want to mess with, right? Those dongles yeah. add up, man. That's right. <laughs> it's a dongle problem. It you is. Don't to, you don't want to have that. No, you don't. Let's uh, let's talk a little about hack5.org, Darren. What what's going? On? You you you've been keeping busy over there, my friend. Oh my gosh. Uh, yes, the uh, the release of the new Wi-Fi pineapple has been uh, huge. So we've um, you know been crazy busy trying to fulfill all of that, and it's been very exciting. Uh, we also just came back from a fantastic conference in San Diego, TorCon, uh, so you can check out the latest episode from there, where we talk about tracking vehicles wirelessly using tire pressure sensors. That's right, every vehicle since 2008 has a wireless tire pressure monitor in it that's basically like a MAC address for your car, and it turns out with a $20 dongle and a little bit of open source software, you can sniff that. How fantastic yeah. is that? You could sniff tires. Drop out your dongle and sniff. You could track you might some, smell like rubber. some cars. Yeah. yeah. HAK5.org. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Thank I you. know you've been real busy. I appreciate you scrambling the jets to get on the show today. It's awesome having <laughs> Thank you. you. Thanks for having me here. <laughs> Don't forget about our subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com, which is a place for you to express your opinion on what stories we should cover, both positively by either submitting a link or voting up a story that you've seen someone else submit or possibly voting something down saying, no, I don't think that's a very good story. I don't want them to talk about that. You can do both those things. That's the way Reddit works. Technewstoday.reddit.com. Don't forget, you can also email us, tnt at twit.tv. Give us a call, 260-TNT-SHOW. Subscribe to our YouTube channel if you're YouTube inclined at youtube.com slash technewstoday. And of course, subscribe to the podcast, get the show notes, all that good stuff at our website, twit.tv slash TNT. We'll be back on Monday. It will still be November, and we're very happy to have David Hewlett back on the show. We'll see you then. Mm-hmm. <laughs>